Good morning and welcome to Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church. Those of you who are here today in person have experienced a great joy. Uh, those of you who aren't here are missing out because Wade is here with us today. So it is a great joy and we have a couple other faces that we haven't seen in a while that we are so glad to welcome back into this space so that we might worship together. I know that we have a few announcements, so I'll let Donna go first. It is so exciting to see Wade back and some of our friends again. It's just so exciting. And I'm also very excited, but yet a little bit tiny panicked because Thanksgiving is almost here already. Um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to go by the um, sign-up sheet for the Thanksgiving baskets, but right now we only have seven people signed up and we need eight more people signed up for the baskets. Please, 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 and thank you. And they're due here at the church next Sunday. Next Sunday, the 20th. And it kind of makes my head go, because mm -hmm. if, if, if you think about what's involved, besides the fact that you need to do all the shopping <laughs> for yourself, and the other people, you need to make room in your fridge. And the turkeys should most likely be partially thawed. It depends on how big your turkey is going to be for the folks that you're buying. A little turkey will be okay if it's a little maybe 10 pounder or so. It will thaw in time for Thanksgiving. But if you're buying a big turkey for a big family, that, that guy's going to need extra time to thaw out because we do want folks to be able to cook it for Thanksgiving. So just that reminder, I wanted to also tell you that the Dill family has made a very generous donation and everybody's going to get a Dutch apple pie, which is a fabulous thing, a wonderful treat. And also, our dear friend and baker extraordinaire, Bonnie Mochen, is going to put together a little treat for every basket. So, um, and the best part, I don't know, it's different and it's exciting for me. This year, um, the Girl Scout Troop 30838, with Tammy's help, is going to, um, a team of girls is going to help us assemble everything. And we actually, because we are focused on a lot of seniors this year, they're gonna help us make deliveries. So there's a lot of pieces in the puzzle. So I'm asking you, please, 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 to not forget. Um, I want you to know that um, if you are at home and mm -hmm. you want to take a basket, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Please call the church. Um, we'll have open lines of communication. If you cannot get out to buy a basket and you need help, I'd be happy to spend your money for you. Um, I just, we mm -hmm. just need to coordinate everything. And I put my whole, I put my whole life aside for this, this kind of time of year. So I am ready and available to help you guys. I can drive to your house. I can pick you up. I can do all kinds of things to help. We just need to work around my work schedule. So next Sunday is the Thanksgiving Day basket pickup and there are again eight more slots signed up there and just as a matter of fact um, I have a girlfriend who calls me every year and says geez Donna can I can I please take a basket and I'm like gee I don't know my church is pretty generous and they sign up pretty quick but this year I'm actually gonna say hey we have an extra few baskets to make so my girlfriend is going to take one. So mm -hmm. if you have a friend or a neighbor that says, hey, are you doing that this year? Think, think about giving them a call and see mm -hmm. if they're interested in signing up for a basket too. Thank you very much. You can even write in the comments on Facebook while we're live in this moment while you're thinking about it that you're willing to do a basket. Perfect. Good morning. Um, to go along with 
Glenn's Do Your Job. Uh, we're on, um, court, we're on uh, Zappy, if you all know that Patriot name, the third string quarterback, that's me. So if you're um, not happy with the video feed, I can be replaced really quick, but <laughs> today I cannot. So um, it, the video is just going to be on broad mm -hmm. um, view the, ever t the entire time. I don't know how to do everything else because I don't know what to do. That's not my job, but I'm stepping in to try. Anyways, I'm here to remind people to sign up for the Advent book study. It will begin the first Sunday after Advent. Um, you start reading on um, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, um, November 27th. We do have the books. We have quite a list. Um, as I stated before, there are crafts involved. Please don't let that hinder you to, to take the time to join this study. You're not required. If you want to have some fun, um, I can tell you that we're going to make some cakes. Um, we're going to make some cards. We're going to, you know, make some little nativity figures. Um, we're gonna do some coloring. So it's all like very, very basic. No need to stress about it. We also have a person, thank you Ingrid, who is willing to lead an online uh, study. Um, if you want to participate and don't, can't come here on Sundays. Um, but you do need to let us know if you want to do that so that I can coordinate with Kim to get the Zoom set up mm -hmm. and with Ingrid to get everything of the technical stuff set up. So um, either in person or online, just come and see me so that we know if we need to order more books because we already have some. The cost of the book is $10. Um, and like I said, we will start um, the Sunday after the first Sunday of December, and it will be around 1130-ish, um, right in the um, fellowship hall, so you have time to go in and have your co coffee and stuff, and then come and do some more um, quiet time reflection. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Mary Gebbin. Um, I'm here representing the Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church Book Club. Um, I don't know if everybody's noticed, but when you're going out after service for coffee and you're walking in the door over there, look to your left and there's a small poster about our book club with some bookmarks. And on the bookmarks are lists and dates of all the books we're planning to read until April, I believe. And we would just love to have you join us. Um, we're a small group right now, five, just five of us regulars, and we meet on the second Saturday um, every month and uh, nine o'clock in the morning, right in there, comfy and cozy and lots of fun. And our motto is, you know, we take up that motto of come if you can, come as you are, and if you haven't read the book, we still come. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's just a really nice time and a really good group, and we'd love to have you. So take a bookmark if you're at all interested, and thank you. The other thing is you can get the bookmark and then read all the books but not go, and then just yes. talk to them at coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And if you are signing up for the Advent study, the books are in my office right now. If you go in the door of my office and just to the right, you'll see them on a little stand. So please feel free to take one if you're participating. We are an active church, aren't we? Which is a good thing. So let us now enter into our time of worship together with our call to worship. Friends, we know what God desires of us. We gather this morning to remind each other about that. So with thanks in our hearts, let us worship God.
Good morning. Our scripture this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Because, God's gra- because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. This is the word of God for for the people of God. Good morning, and welcome to Learning Together. So this morning, um, I'm going to tell you a story. I was looking at a, uh, reading someone from uh, someone's commentary on this scripture that Donna just read uh, from Joanne Taylor, and she suggested telling a story. And I thought, what a great idea. So I am telling a story today about the three little pigs. Oh, I see smiles, so you know this story, huh? All right, good. So this story about the three little pigs talks about three pigs who decided they wanted to all go out on their own after living together. The first pig made a house out of straw. So he was really happy because everything went well. Straw was good for him. The next pig, went out and made his own house out of sticks. And he was happy because everything worked great just like he wanted. The third pig went out and made his house out of bricks. And he was really happy because everything worked the way he wanted to. Then comes the wolf. He comes to the house of straw and says, little pig, little pig, let me in. And if you don't let me in, I'm gonna huff and puff and blow your house down. Well, sure enough, he blows and blows, and the house goes away. So the little pig runs over to the house with the sticks. So that he's at, now the wolf is at the house with the sticks and says, little pig, little pig, let me in, or I'm going to huff and puff and blow your house down. Well, sure enough, he huffs and puffs, and that house, too, oops, goes away. So now we have two pigs. They run over to the house with the bricks, and they will go and stay with him, and the, and the, the, Wolf, sure enough, shows up at his house and says, little pig, little pig, let me in. And and he says, well, I'm going to huff and puff and blow your house down. So he huffs and he puffs and he blows and he blows. Does he blow the house down? No, he can't blow the house down. So the house stays. And in Paul's letter to Corinth, that's exactly what he was talking about, because at the time, the church of Corinth, they were divided. There was a big rivalry within the church, not with the leaders, but the people following the leaders, because each one thought, each group of ch- church people that went to one leader thought they were better off because they were this leader, and then this faction group went over and said, oh, no, my leader is better than yours, and this is how it came to be, and, of course, that was not a very good situation. So Paul is reminding us and reminding the church of Corinth as well that we are all servants of Christ working together. Our mission statement reads that it's our mission to change people's lives through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our building blocks are much stronger than the 
see than the, than the straw and the sticks, even the bricks, because Jesus Christ is our strong foundation. And when Jesus is our foundation, we could come to know the grace of God and we could go forward to share God's love with others. Let us pray. Dear God, continue to remind us that we all have a solid foundation in Christ Jesus, and that foundation, with the grace of God, will never falter. Thank you, God. Amen.
Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? God, we thank you for bringing us together again. We thank you especially for bringing Wade and Vicki back with us. So guide our thoughts, our hearts, our actions as we hear your word and think about what it is you are saying to us today. So may my words and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So whenever I have control of the remote, I head for HGTV because I love those home improvement shows. I know. I kind of have this thing about love it or list it, but the, the new one where they, where they go in and they fix the people who've started their own home renovation and are doing it wrong, yeah, that's the, I aspire to be one of those homeowners. The homeowners are always so excited, right, when they meet the hosts and they, they always need another bathroom, right, have to have an ensuite. They need a walk-in pantry, and then they want to open up that wall between the dining room and the kitchen, and they share their budget with the designer, and somehow, whether their budget is 50000 or 250000 it's exactly enough to do what's on their wish list. You'd think someone knew in advance. And it all goes well until they discover that that wall they want to take out to have an open concept home is a load-bearing wall. Their budget is never prepared for that because no one seems to anticipate needing to work on the foundation of their home. We simply take foundations for granted until there's a problem. Well, today, Paul switches up his metaphors, and after talking about seeds and watering, he shifts to buildings. It's one of those early mixed metaphor sermons, although he does sort of finish out one metaphor before he goes to the next. So as any master builder will tell you, everything depends on the foundation because it has to be able to withstand anything. And Paul says very clearly, as Ingrid just reminded us, that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ. Everything is built on Jesus. Paul tells the conflicted church in Corinth to remember their foundation. And the metaphor makes sense. It stands the test of time. And while much has changed in 2,000 years, the need for a strong foundation hasn't. Now, there's a lot that goes into building a church, as we know, and not just the physical building. There's also the building of the congregation that gathers to worship and scatters to serve. Programs, music, preaching, mission trips, Sunday school, potluck suppers. It all has to rest on the same foundation, on Jesus, or the walls start cracking and the floors sag. And we have a tendency these days to focus on the individual, but Paul is writing to the church as a whole, not to just one person. So when he says you, he means the plural, not the singular, or as my Episcopal priest friend from Kentucky would say, he means all y'all, not just y'all. It's fun to meet someone from Kentucky and Vermont. It's, um, and that's because authentic Christianity is rooted in our life together. We heard that last week when Doug shared his stewardship moment, how he needs church, the place, and the people to recenter him, to get him back to what matters, because being part of a community whose mission is to change lives through a relationship with Jesus Christ matters. And that's our foundation here at Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church. Now, it's kind of tempting sometimes to imagine our church being on one of those HGTV shows. I always think they at least ought to do a parsonage one, but <laughs> knocking out walls, adding rooms here and there, putting in more much-needed closet space, but we need to remember our foundation, what we're built on. 
That's why we're always asking questions like, how does this idea, how does this program, how does this book study help change lives through a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because if it doesn't, it's going to compromise our foundation. Now, the stewardship committee gets this. That's why they aren't asking you to fund a budget like some churches do. Ask the confirmation class about their recent visit to another church. We're asking you to build on the foundation of changing lives through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because a building is only as strong as its foundation. Our stewardship campaign is about digging deeper and wider shoring up our foundation, remembering who and whose we are and how we are called to work together so lives will be changed through relationship with Christ. Spiritual practices, not just individual spiritual practices, but ones we practice collectively as a congregation help us go wider and deeper together. And that's what's at the heart of our annual campaign, deepening and widening our practices of generosity and gratitude. Now, gratitude is social. It's something that draws us together. Just as Thanksgiving dinner isn't Thanksgiving dinner without a table full of friends and family to share in the feast, gratitude isn't gratitude until it's shared. In her book, titled Gratitude, Diana Butler Bass notes, the deepest experiences of gratitude move us beyond islands of isolation into connection and community. And isn't that church, connection and community? And I see that every day here at our church as lives are changed through a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's all these ways that our ministry weaves together to make that possible. Nate Berniking, who is the Director of Financial and Administrative Ministries of the Missouri United Methodist Church and an author, reminds us that no ministry in a local church exists in isolation. They flow in and out of each other. And we see that happen here all the time, right? When Sage Ministry talks about visiting members in their home and then the Sunday school and the youth group make cards for them, each person working in one ministry is somehow related, sometimes literally related, around here I've noticed, to those working in other ministries and it makes our bonds stronger. Our confirmation class this year is based on this principle. It's not about learning specific dates in Methodist history or reciting creeds. It's about making disciples. Each confirmand has been paired with an adult mentor chosen because they are people who walk the talk. What better way to help our youth understand what it means to be a person of faith than by inviting them to be in conversation with someone who is. So maybe we all need mentors to help us live out our faith, people who show us how to practice generosity, gratitude, and another related discipline or gift, hospitality. Our mentors don't need to tell us how much to give to the church or to any other organization. They simply give generously of their time, talent, and treasure and set an example for us to follow. As I said, hospitality is very closely related to generosity in my book. And I think if this congregation did a spiritual gifts test as a whole, not as a bunch of individuals separately, hospitality would probably come out as our strongest gift from coffee hour to collations, sharing space with community groups. Even when we repaved the parking lot last year, everything we do is about welcoming others so that they too may have their lives changed by a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I invite you this week to take some time to pray both before and after completing your financial pledge card for the coming year. 
as you do thank God for this church, for the people, for the building, for the resources we share with one another and with our community, all built on a solid foundation, the grace of Jesus Christ. I'm grateful to the mentors I've had over the years who have shown me how to be generous, the ones who've helped me understand that pledging financial resources to the church is not about meeting the budget, but about opening my heart and sharing my blessings with others. I pledge to Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church not because I'm expected to. I give because of the way this church has helped change my life through an ever-deepening relationship with Jesus Christ and the way I've seen it change your lives. This church's foundation is solid, so let's work together to keep it that way. Thanks be to God. be seated as we turn our hearts and minds to prayer. God, it's been a long week. We've been bombarded with information, with maps covered in blue and red. Thank you for gathering us here in your haven, a place to recenter, a place to be reminded who and whose we truly are. We take a deep breath of gratitude. God, our prayer list grows. So many people, so many needs. Some days it's overwhelming. We're doing what we can, delivering prayer shawls and casseroles, and we're counting on you to bring healing and wholeness where it's needed. After all, you promised to be with us always. We take a deep breath of trust. Still, we wonder when swords will be turned to plowshares when wars will end, when peace will prevail. Of course, maybe you're wondering when we'll turn swords into plowshares, when we'll say no to war, when we'll make peace 
the way of the world. And so we take a deep breath of hope. God, we have decisions to make this week, pledge cards to complete as we wonder how can we be generous when heating costs are rising, when gas prices are too high, when groceries cost more. Help us to remember that our gifts change us and change others as we come to know you and your amazing grace. Help us open our doors and our hearts wider each day that we may love as you love. And so we take a deep, deep breath, renewing our promise to bring the kingdom nearer each day. And so together we pray the words Jesus teaches us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, so Dave and Robin are coming up for our uh, stewardship moment. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dave Eckbold. This is my wife, Robin. I'm going to take this opportunity to briefly introduce ourselves to you. Go ahead. I need my glasses. <laughs> my name is Robin Eckbold. I have three children. My oldest daughter is a supervisor at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab. My son is a tech sergeant in the Air Force EOD, the Explosive, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. He's on the Bob Squad. I don't know why he picked that. And my youngest daughter is a film director. I'm kidding. She actually manages a local movie theater. <laughs> I have two daughters. My oldest daughter is uh, a junior in college, and she's uh, specializing in nursing. She loves working at UMass, uh, where she gets to get hands-on and work with patients and different people. She's in the uh, critical care area, so she meets people at their worst time. And my other daughter, Marley, who brought her friend Kendall today, uh, she's a senior in college, I'm sorry, in high school, and she's going to be pursuing psychology in the fall, uh, hoping to be a uh, psychologist specializing in addiction counseling. We began attending this church because we found ourselves no longer aligned to the church we were going to. Sounds familiar, just like uh, Jeff, Jeff uh, this week. Um, and uh, we, when we decided to change churches, we prayed to Jesus the Lord and, and just asked of him to tell us where we going, should go. When the churches opened up again after the, that phase of the pandemic, um, we Googled Blackstone Churches in Blackstone Valley. We saw this church's website, and as you've heard numerous times now, the most important thing on that was the mission statement. Our mission is to change people's lives through the relationship with Jesus Christ. That, the inclusion of everyone, and the fact that the pastor was uh, a female. That, that sealed it. That was bingo for us. So we support his, this church and his church in our community. Because I was raised in a, a home where stewardship was definitely foremost, and one of, one of the tenets of our, our worship, uh, we, we, were grow, we grew up with, um, with, with giving uh, our little bit of, uh, I'll say, allowance into the Sunday school offering basket. And then uh, come Sunday morning, uh, one of me, my brothers, or my sister were out, allowed to take the weekly family's offering envelope 
and put that in the plate. That was actually an honor for us, a treat, as we knew the money was given to the form of worship and thanks to God. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul says, I planted this seed in your hearts, Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. In the context of this scripture, my role in our family's giving plan is that of the planter. When we see a need, Robin and I discuss where to plant the seed, which is where we will give, and what to plant, what type of gift it'll be, whether it's financial or tangible. So that seed that we plant will be blessed and God will make it grow. If it's a tangible gift, Robin, who's our family of Apollos, she waters the seed by shopping, organizing, and delivering the seed with the promise that God will make it grow. I do actually love this part of church. It's very, very close to my heart. Thanksgiving and Christmas baskets are no different. Having grown up extremely poor, my mother was alone with four little girls and we went hungry a lot, and it was really, really hard. So I make sure every year when those gift tags come out for those baskets, those kids on that list are getting breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. We're gonna start with pancakes and donuts and Pop-Tarts and all the sugar they want. <laughs> then we move on to turkey and vegetables that they like. I remember being on the receiving end of a basket that my mom got, and there were root vegetables that we didn't even know how to cook. So that was difficult. I've grown to love them now, but I also know what children like. And of course, we give them super sweet desserts and things like that. Christmas is another thing that's very, very humbling for me. Again, growing up, there really wasn't money for Christmas. My mom was very creative every year she would buy us coloring books and then she'd get like the 64 Crayola crayon box, but she'd separate them into packages of like six crayons to like make it stretch. So that was neat. And then she would make us all mittens, which it's beautiful to get a homemade gift until you wear knit mittens outside that the snow sticks to it, your hands are freezing and it's horrible. So when it comes to Christmas and we're picking tags off that tree, again, near and dear to my heart. My ex-husband and I were married for over 20 years. After 18 years, he lost his job. Our children were on the receiving end of that tree one year. It was the most humbling, hardest thing I had had to do since I was a child, knowing my mom did it. And I remember having to write down what the kids wanted. And my youngest, the movie producer, all she wanted was a Polly Pocket travel train and we couldn't afford it and I actually wrote it on the tag. And I remember when we went to pick up the gifts, it definitely wasn't a travel train because it was, oh, excuse me, it was like this big. And I was like, oh, I should probably open it and just see what it is. And I opened it and it was beautiful. It was a box of 100 earrings, adorable. She didn't have pierced ears. So I was like, if my one thing I could say to people is get them what's on the tag or close because that's really, really difficult. So I try very, very hard to relate my background to my giving when I go forward. As far as me financially giving, I don't have a lot of money. That usually ends up in David's field. Sometimes we will take the Foxy travel bus into New York for a day. And one year we took um, our stepdaughter, my stepdaughters. And I went to the bank and I took out 50 ones. And when we got to New York, they were just little at the time, I gave them each 25 ones and they walked around and they gave to every homeless person that was sitting on the side of the street, which was adorable because then they wanted more money from me because they immediately <laughs> ran out. It was adorable. But the part that I knew that it was planted was a year or two later, one of those daughters wrote an essay in school and said when she grows up, she wants to be like someone she knows who goes and takes all their money and walks around New York and gives it to people. So that seed was planted and it was quite wonderful. So that is my side of giving. And if it resonates with any of you, I hope that it does. Go ahead, honey. As we continue to give our weekly offering gifts, 
and we're blessed to be able to give in other ways, as you heard from Robin. There are Christian-based uh, missions and organizations that are uh, in our community that we have and, and currently do support. Uh, we directly support the Piece of Bread Community Kitchen, Children's Haven Ministries in Douglas, and uh, yeah, we give them an ongoing gift and uh, support their summer work by either sponsoring a camper or a cabin. And uh, stewardship is far more than writing a check and placing it in an offering envelope. It's using God's gifts, such as being handy and able to do things, serving others, and even administration to bring the glory of God through Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And what I heard the undercurrent in your testimony is that once you start giving, it's kind of hard to stop. You just find more and more ways to, uh, to bless others. So the ushers will now wait upon us. Let us give thanks. Gracious God, as we present these offerings, may we be reminded of the many blessings you have shared with us as individuals and as a community of believers. You have fed us with the milk of your grace and have nurtured us with a love that knows no limits or boundaries. May our sharing this day reveal our priorities and our promises, for we belong to you and offer you our gifts that they may be used in mission and in ministry to bring glory to you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.
with hearts renewed by visions of freedom and souls nourished by the promise of love. Let us go together in service to the liberating Christ, lover of all the earth, healer of everything that aches. Go in peace in the company of God and all God's people say, Amen.